material guy. Good to see you. Hey, everybody. Hey, Jack. Good to see you again. Jack is on tomorrow. Um, very much looking forward to getting to hear from Jack. Uh, I see Elle on. Good to see you, Elle. Uh, Tim. Hey there. Good group. I hope you all had a really good weekend. Um, the uh, show is starting off pretty well so far. As you may know, if you watch, um, we always tune it to 92.3 in El Paso, um, the classic rock station, and uh, Tom Petty comes on, which is great. And his song started just as the show started. So um, that's a good sign. We see Lorraine on. Okay, I'm going to bring Lorraine on in just a second. Lorraine Barabil is our guest. She is the representative for the 100th state house district in Texas. There are 150 districts. She represents the 100th in Dallas County. She'll tell us a little bit about what that district looks like, who it is that she serves, and then just what she's up against. Um, if you saw, sorry, I'm going to change the angle of this. If you saw the teaser for um, the show today, we say, you know, Lorraine's got to run for re-election. She has a special runoff election in July, and she has to do it in the midst of COVID-19. She is representing a constituency in the least insured state in the United States of America at a time where you need access to healthcare more than at any other time in the history of our country, and certainly in the state of Texas. Um, you have a very voter suppressed, very racially gerrymandered state, and um, she once showed me a map of her district, and it looks nothing like a representative district. It looks like a very cynical attempt to keep some people in power and keep others out of power. So I want to ask Lorraine about all those issues and then of course take your questions. There's a little question box right here at the bottom of your screen. For those of you wondering, yes, I'm washing the blue shirt today. Um, we'll have it back on for tomorrow. Um, quick note though, um, in our Powered by People family, Powered by People is the organization that we started at the beginning of this year to work on campaigns in Texas, specifically state house races, and to try to win a majority in the state house in Texas for the first time in 20 years, um, just before the state gets redistricted again. Um, there's an amazing volunteer who came out to uh, knock on doors with us maybe six weeks ago, actually to knock on doors for Lorraine Birabil. Uh, her name's Catherine. And I was reading Twitter yesterday, which you should probably never do. And certainly I had no excuse to be doing it on Easter, but I'm glad that I did because Catherine posted that she had lost her mom to coronavirus. And um, there was just an outpouring of love and support from powered by people, family members, just folks on Twitter who happened to see her post. I had a chance to talk to her and her grandmother today. And I want to let you all know that Catherine seems to be doing okay, although um, very tough to lose your mom and very tough to lose her in this way and very tough to lose her at a time where you literally cannot be with her, be at her bedside or grieve in the way that we are accustomed to grieving the, the loss of somebody uh, in our lives. So Catherine, if you're watching this, um, thank you for talking with me. Thank you for letting all of us know. Uh, we are so sorry for your loss, but you have to know that we are all with you right now and we are sending you a shit ton of love and strength and power to you and look forward to being with you in person again when we can all get together again in North Texas after this passes. Um, I mentioned there's others in our family who've lost a family member, uh, others in our greater Powered by People family um, who are struggling because a family member is sick right now. We just are sending our best and all of our love to, to all of you right now. Okay, um, quick numbers, and then I wanna get Lorraine on as, as quickly as I can so you can ask your questions of her. Um, this is what it looks like in the world, in the United States and Texas right now. Uh, we're almost at 2 million officially reported cases in the world. Almost 120,000 human beings on planet Earth have lost their lives to COVID-19. These are the official numbers, and by most estimates are nowhere close to what the real numbers are. They're much, much higher, but this is what has been officially reported globally. In the United States, you now have almost 600,000 cases. You have 23,000 deaths. We have more deaths in this country than does any other country, including Italy right now. And 3 million tests, and 3 million tests is a lot better than zero tests, but 3 million tests is not 327 
million tests. We need a lot more tests and we need them a lot more quickly. In Texas, almost 14,000 cases, almost 300 of our fellow Texans have officially died of COVID-19. Again, we don't know what the real number is because Texas is testing lower per capita than any other state in the union. So we probably have a worse idea than any other state in the union about how many people have coronavirus in Texas right now, which not only affects our ability to accurately report the numbers, it affects our ability to stop the spread of coronavirus and to isolate those who have it and to trace their contacts to make sure that others who may have coronavirus are isolating for 14 days and not further spreading this virus. Those are the numbers that we have. One other chart that I want to show you, this is something that the Financial Times publishes every single day. And you might not be able to read everything on this chart, but basically it tracks number of deaths per day uh, after a country has reported its first day of three deaths. Um, China is that yellow line that's kind of trailing off in the middle and then it goes all the way to the bottom. South Korea is that blue line that you can see. Italy, you can see, uh, has come down now on the other side of the curve just to, at least on my screen, to my left at the very top of the screen is the United States still going up. I think this is a really important point to bear in mind because while we are seeing lower admissions in New York, while we're seeing Gavin Newsom, the governor of California's efforts paying off in that state uh, by a shelter in place order issued early enough that it stopped uh, the spread of the pandemic, at least stopped it from what it could have been. We are still seeing cases go up in the United States. Few countries on this chart are, are reporting the same. So um, the worst is not over yet. Please continue to stay at home. Please continue to keep your physical distance at least six feet from other people when you're at the grocery store or volunteering at the food bank or working at the hospital if you can, where you can. Um, please continue to wear masks, uh, wear gloves, and just be really smart, really good, and really kind to one another. Um, these are the important things to keep in mind. Lorraine Birabil is a representative in the Texas State House. She won election to her first time term in the state house on January the 28th. So she's just a couple of months into the job. And as her luck would have it, she's having to run again right away. She is in a contested Democratic primary that will be settled in July. The original runoff date was May. That got pushed back because of our concerns about coronavirus. So interested in what it's like for her to run as a candidate right now with an election coming up. Also want to hear about her priorities. And then we certainly want to hear your questions. And so there's a question button right here. If you click on that, uh, I will try to bring you into the conversation with your questions. Please keep them pertinent to Lorraine, to her job, to what's going on in the state of Texas and in the country right now. All right, Lorraine, I'm going to try to patch you in. Here we go. The fox is playing right now. I'll keep the job easier. Commercial. Get in the zone. Hey, Lorraine, how hey. are you? Hey. So good to see I'm you. I'm fine, doing fine. Just, you know, at home, following shelter in place orders, trying to stay healthy. And and stay sane, I guess. You've got a little one in there. Absolutely. Um, so, um, hi, everybody. I know that some of you um, have actually seen in person uh, when Beto came to Block Walk here in, in Texas, um, and that was really awesome. And so I'm glad to be able to visit with you again, Beto, and everyone uh, who is Team Beto. Um, many of you um, have been, you know, involved from the very beginning, and we need to obviously stay engaged. Um, my name is Lorraine Baraville. I'm the state representative for District 100. Um, and as Beto mentioned earlier, um, that is the district I represent. And I'm coming up on my fourth election uh, in a period of less than a year. Um, so as we know, the election was moved because of um, the virus. It was moved from May to July. And so uh, right now, frankly, we're more so focused on making sure we are helping constituents and, and being of service. Um, so, so far we've had uh, numerous events, uh, of course, with social distance in mind, uh, some online, some on telephone. Um, we did um, a town hall uh, with Congressman BC, our County Judge Clay Jenkins, as well as the Director of our Health and Human Services, um, our D D Dallas ISD Superintendent. Um, and so that was a really great and 
got a lot of good information out to people. That was actually ahead of the shelter and order plate, uh, shelter and order um, provision, just because I wanted everyone to be prepared. And so then after that, we did um, some other events. We did a senior town hall. Most recently, we did a small business and nonprofit workshop, making sure that those organizations know how to access uh, the stimulus funds that were passed um, in the various stimulus packages. Um, this is the first time that the SBA has worked with organizations like nonprofits. And so uh, we know, um, like you mentioned, Beto, so many, um, you know, people are affected by the fact that our social safety net is not what it should be, um, especially nonprofits, because what ends up happening is when our social safety net is inadequate, a lot of times those nonprofits like food banks, like churches, step in and try to fill that gap. And even they are hurting right now um, because of the crisis that we're dealing with. I want to ask you what you're hearing from your constituents. I mentioned at the outset that we are the least insured state in the country. We make it so incredibly hard for people to see a doctor. We make it even harder for women and specifically women of color. And that's borne out in the fact that Texas is the epicenter of a maternal mortality crisis, uh, three times as deadly for black women in Texas as this state has closed down a quarter of its family planning clinics and it's interesting that in the midst of this pandemic, not only is it hard for people to get access to health care in a state that is so uninsured, but the governor has decided to make abortion and reproductive planning services non-essential health care services, making it even harder. And we know that beyond abortion, a family planning clinic, a Planned Parenthood clinic might provide a cervical cancer screening or family planning help or just be um, the medical provider that a person can go to when they don't have a lot of other options. What are your constituents telling you? Yeah, we are actually hearing uh, quite a bit about that. Um, obviously, people are concerned about being out of work uh, because how this uh, crisis has affected uh, people's ability to go to work, obviously, because not everyone can work from home. But uh, I can tell you as a new mom, um, knowing that Texas has the, you know, has a, I'll just say, not the greatest reputation, not only for women's reproductive health in general, but on so many issues, voting rights, what have you. As I uh, was in my hospital bed, laboring to deliver my daughter, I wondered, am I going to make it through this? Mm. Am I going to get to meet her? Am I going to be, be able to survive long enough to take care of her because of the crisis we have in Texas? Mm. Um, and so we have a lot of work to do there. And certainly uh, with the governor um, putting that ban in place, um, declaring that uh, abortion services are not essential services, which I do not agree with that. Um, but that is the antithesis of what we need to be doing right now. We already have a critical care shortage. You know, my district is one of the most uninsured in the state. But then on top of that, this is not the time that we want people to be traveling to get an essential medical service. Um, as we are all sheltering in place, it means even more important that if we do need to go get medical services, that it's close by, that we're not putting ourselves or other people in danger um, by traveling. This is not the time for that when it's not uh, necessary. I think it's frankly a political thing that's just being used um, and it's hurting women and it's hurting Texans in general. We have talked a lot about voter suppression gerrymandering, the fact that in, in Texas, there is a race-based aspect to gerrymandering. The federal courts found in 2017 that um, those Republican state reps who redrew our boundaries did so based on race, trying to minimize the impact of black voters and Hispanic voters and maximize the impact of white voters, you'd shown me a, a picture of your district, the map of your district, and it, it does not look like a coherent, contiguous um, district that, that we should have. One other dynamic to voter suppression right now, of course, is voting in the time of COVID-19. We saw what just happened in Wisconsin recently, where though the governor tried to stop voting and postpone it, the Republican majority Supreme Court uh, forced voters to go out and risk their lives in order to cast a ballot. What are we going to see in Texas? Do we have universal vote by mail in Texas now? Or if this pandemic is still raging in July, will your constituents potentially be forced to go out and vote in person? So that is something that I am really um, adamant about. You know, and last time we chatted, you know, I talked about um, the role that I was involved with with voter ID, suing the state to make sure that the discriminatory law was not implemented. And in that case, we won that case. 
um, and, and they had to roll back that law. But uh, with regard to universal vote by mail, I definitely think that, you know, voting is a fundamental right and people should not have to risk their health literally to go cast a ballot. And so I agree with the state party's action to sue, um, to, to uh, go take this to court so that we can expand vote by mail access. We know that the virus is highly unlikely to survive the mail processing uh, process that the, that the Postal Service uses. And so voting by mail is a safe way to cast your ballot. Um, and if we are gonna allow in-person voting, Obviously, we need to make sure that all the safety precautions and things of that nature are in place. But I think the most prudent thing to do is to do what some other states already allow. There are already states before this crisis that allowed universal vote by mail. And we should definitely be making voting easier, not harder. And we know in Texas, unfortunately, we have a track record of making it harder to vote by those who have been in control the last 20, 30 years in Austin. It, it sure seems like a, a cynical attempt to keep those who are in power entrenched in power if they do not allow for universal vote by mail in the midst of this pandemic. Uh, Lorraine, I'm gonna look at the questions that have been submitted. Um, uh, Bans Animals asks, Beto, is that the clash behind you? That is the clash behind me right there. Um, Jack is asking, uh, can you, to the degree you can, can you talk about who qualifies now for absentee and mail-in mail -in ballots in Texas? That's a question from Jack. Thank you, Jack. That is a very good question. So to qualify um, to vote by mail in the state of Texas, automatically, if you're 65 or older, you can vote by mail. And so to the extent that you live in Texas and you're 65 or older, please go ahead and um, request your vote by mail application. Um, turn in your application so that you can cast your ballot safely from your home. Um, also, if you are disabled, you can uh, qualify to vote by mail. You don't have to um, provide a doctor's note or anything like that to show your disability. If you are disabled, then you can cast a ballot to vote by mail. Also, if you are going to be uh, not in your uh, voting address, like if you're not at your residence, so for example, uh, typically this is used by students who are away at school who want to vote at their permanent address, which is typically their parent's house. Um, they could vote remotely as well. And then obviously if you're um, overseas, you can vote by mail. Obviously members of our armed services, a lot of them fall into this category as, as well as expa ex expatriates. Um, so those are right now the categories, you know, obviously we would like for this to be opened up so that more people can do Everyone. this. And there is a discussion as to using the, um, the fact that this condition could put people in harm's way uh, is that does that qualify as a disability? And so that's something that that has to be examined. Uh, Bryce asked a couple of questions, um, asked about uh, campaign tips for or, or tips on campaigning in the midst of a pandemic. And then this general question, any recommendations for running for local office? So um, you just mentioned that because you had to run in the November election, um, then you had to run in the runoff to the November election then you had to run in the March primary. Now you're having to run in the runoff to the March primary, four elections in six months. Um, any advice for people who are considering running for the first time or they themselves are running in their first campaign? Well, my first campaign was just a few months ago. So I feel like it's still fresh for me. Um, the biggest thing um, when you wanna get started is your why. Um, and I'm sure Beto, you could relate to this. Campaigning is extremely hard. It's hard on you personally, it's hard on your family. And so you have to really have your why as to why this makes sense for you. Um, for me, it's because of my daughter. Um, she's gonna be a year old on the 28th. Um, she never got to meet her grandmother. Her grandmother died a month before she was born because she was 64 years old, too young for Medicare. And as a registered nurse, she was in the Medicaid gap. She earned too much to qualify for standard Medicaid, but not enough to pay out of pocket. Mm. There's 1 million other Texans just like Millie. And so when things get hard, get challenging, I think of her, I think of my daughter, and I think, you know, what I'm doing means something. Um, and although I've been involved in, in doing things like suing the state of Texas to make sure that, you know, people can vote, um, when you think about your why, that's what's going to keep you going. So the first thing is you have to really examine why do I want to do this? Um, and then obviously you got to call on your friends and family <laughs> um, because you can't do it by yourself, you know, and 
I'm thankful to have, you know, my friend Beto with me and all the people that I've worked with and known over the years and their confidence in me that I could do this. And, you know, my neighbors, obviously, they voted for me three times. So <laughs> I need them to support me again. But I would just say, you know, those, you know, your reason, your why, having the support of people that um, know you and know that you can do the job. And the other part is, you know, those people are going to be your source of volunteers. So um, the ability of people to make a difference, you have to believe in that and know that that's how you're going to get there. And so that's your source of volunteers. And then also individual support and form of contributions. Um, when I do these town halls, you know, they cost money. They're not free. We have to make sure that people have a, a steady and a reliable conference call line that they can call into and get the information. And so asking for, you know, $25, $10, whatever people can do, um, it makes a difference. And so that's what we've been focusing on is, is serving and making sure we're getting the information out to people. But I would say my best advice for campaigning is just uh, knowing your why, getting your, 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 uh, your village of support around you to make sure that this is something that collectively makes sense. Um, and then doing what you can to get your volunteers and your financial support you need. Great, great advice. Uh, Catherine asks, um, and I believe Catherine was, was one of the young people knocking on doors for you last time I saw you. What is your response to Greg Abbott considering reopening Texas businesses? So I, I think that that would be a mistake right now. We have to make sure that the decisions that we make are science-based and evidence-driven. Um, and that's not just for, um, you know, the, the kind of information we want to provide to students in education, educational settings. This applies for public policy decisions. When we say flatten the curve, this is based on data. This is based on the fact that we know that this virus will infect the, the average number is three people. If someone gets infected, they're going to spread it to three people. Um, and I was listening to an NPR story the other day, and they're talking about how, well, if you recovered from COVID and you decide to um, donate plasma, um, they can actually recover three sets to um, help treat three people. So that's um, pretty uh, ironic of the universe right. <laughs> to make it to where you could infect and also treat three people. Yeah. Um, so... <laughs> But I, I bring that up to say that um, we are not out of the woods yet. We're not at the peak. Numerically, we have not flattened the curve enough to say that it's time to, to reopen for business. And so, yes, a lot of people are working from home, and that has been challenging for some. But there are also some who are going out to work every day and making sure that we can all keep going. Um, I am a UFCW member. I actually drafted a letter to the governor asking that grocery workers be considered um, first responders, essential employees. And as a result of that work and others, um, the governor ended up declaring grocery workers as essential workers. And we have so many other people, healthcare workers, what have you, that are really keeping us going right now. We need to be thankful for their service. Um, but it's not just enough for us to, you know, those that say you can work from home, we can all be doing our part, volunteering at phone banks, at volunteering at, at uh, food banks, volunteering in ways, making masks, what have you. We should all be doing what we can to be helpful. And so long story short, I do not support <laughs> the decision to open because it's not based on the data of where we are right now. It, it is so refreshing to hear you talk about basing a decision on facts and science and the truth. You got a lot of love while you were um, answering that question because it is at such odds with the person that we have in the White House right now. And, and even our, our governor, and I, and I hate to say that as proud as I am to be a Texan, that we would have a governor um, who would wait so long to issue the shelter in place order, who would have Texas dead last in the country in testing per capita. So we really don't have a good idea of how widespread COVID-19 or coronavirus is in Texas right now, who would keep churches open, um, but close other uh, essential services and so a tremendous amount of confusion in the state when he finally did uh, issue the shelter in place order and refused to call it what it was. Um, yeah. And the fights that he's picked with your county judge, Clay Jenkins, make no sense to me. This is a time for us all to try to get on the same team and to work together. So love your answer. Here's, here's a question from one of your fellow candidates. Uh, she's running in a different district, Jennifer Skidenenko, um, another hero of mine uh, who we will have on the show at some point. She asks, how are the homeless getting help in your district? 
Um, offline, I think she wants to introduce you to an organization that's working on that in, in her district. Any thoughts uh, about the uh, homeless constituents that you serve and how they're getting help right now? Yeah, so um, we actually are open. Um, so we're not open in person, obviously, because we are obeying the the um, recommendation of medical providers um, and our county judge, Clay Jenkins, to shelter in place. Well, we Our office is working remotely. We actually have already assisted people who were homeless. There was a constituent who, um, because of the shelter in place order, seniors, you're not allowed to visit senior facilities right now. Um, understandably so, because they're among the most vulnerable in our community for spread. And uh, there is a senior who qualified to be in one of these communities but was not able to be housed in it because of the order. And so um, my caseworker, Ms. O.C. Kazee, worked diligently with the, with the state, and now the state has covered a one-month hotel stay while they try to figure out what facility she can go to. And so that's just one example. Um, I work for you. If you live in District 100, I work for you. And so to the extent that I can be helpful, um, please visit uh, my website, which is house HD 100, like H like house, D like district, 100.org. And we have a whole page that's dedicated strictly to COVID resources. And our contact information is on there. If you call either our capital or our district number, we answer that line. You know, I was going to say at the outset, this has got to be so frustrating for you because you've just been elected to the state legislature. Uh, and we mentioned you've had three elections so far. You're, you're going to have a fourth to confirm it in July. But because the Texas legislature only meets once every two years, you literally have not had a chance to sit in session and work on and um, introduce and vote on legislation. And yet, I've also got to think this is fulfilling because you're talking about all the constituent casework that you're doing right now. Um, you mentioned some examples in the answer about some of your homeless constituents. You talk about how you're using your resources on the web to connect people to services in the district and then the town hall meetings that you're holding for seniors or different constituencies within HD 100 to reach out to them. So even though you're not literally sitting in the chair um, in the legislative chamber right now, you're still cranking for people that you work. You're still getting the job done for them, which I just think is awesome. And, you know, at a moment where we can be uh, resigned to uh, despair or being depressed um, or, or just, uh, you know, being down about everything that's going on. And there are some things that are really tough right now, for sure, for some more than others, to find examples like you and others who are using a position of privilege or power or public trust to do something good for all of us. Um, we got to remind ourselves of that because we are going to get through this and we've got to look to the examples and the people who will get us through that. There are some people who aren't, um, and we're, we're certainly gonna point them out as well, but we're so grateful for what you're doing and the way that you're doing this work. And as someone who knocked on doors for you and got to knock on doors with you, uh, I'm just so proud of the work that you're doing and so grateful that you're there. And I hope that you're joined by Jennifer and by these amazing candidates who are running all across the state of Texas right now. Uh, so many of them women, um, and so many of them running for the first time who, who I think are just going to be wonderful colleagues of yours okay. and produce a majority that's going to get stuff done on. You mentioned the, the really tough, tragic story of your grandmother passing away, not old enough to uh, enroll in Medicare, um, not earning enough to be able to afford private insurance. You have to take the lead on expanding access to health care in this state for people who are in the same position that your grandmother was gun violence in a state that has chosen to keep the gun stores open in the midst of this pandemic um, you've got to show us that there is a common sense way that republicans democrats independents alike can come together on confronting climate change uh taking a lead on issues that we know better than anyone else like immigration these are all things i've seen you talk to your constituents about or to voters about and i'm just so grateful that you're there and looking forward to this being confirmed in, in the July election. Uh, folks, this is Lorraine Birabil. And if you want to find out more about her, do, do we go to hd100.org? Yeah, so if you need help um, with um, connecting to resources, helping you with unemployment, anything that's related to this pandemic, you would go to hd100.org. And then if you want to find out how you can get involved, um, help with our mission, that would be LorraineForTexas.com. 
Um, on LorraineProtectus.com, you can sign up to be a virtual volunteer because we are taking it digital. Um, so you can uh, volunteer remotely uh, from the safety of your home as you're sheltering in place, as you should. Um, you can also make a contribution if you can, but mainly we just want to make sure that everyone is getting involved and we don't let up because that's what they want us to do. That is how they are going to win. And how we're going to win is by staying engaged and staying involved. And that's why I just want to thank you, Beto, for helping light that torch because we have to keep Texans engaged if we're going to get through this and elect a Democratic speaker. It's going to happen. It's going to happen. And you're going to be a big part of it. Thank you for spending some time with us. And thanks for everything that you're doing. And we wish you and your family the best of health and the best of luck going forward. And I remember what it was like to have a one-year-old in our house, but we were not confined to the house 24 <laughs> hours a day, seven days a week. So I wish you luck uh, in, in being a parent in this really difficult time. Thank you for what you do. Thank you, Beto. Bye-bye. Thanks, everybody. All right. That's Lorraine, Lorraine Birabil. Um, You've got to feel, as I do, that we are so lucky to have her serving in the state legislature and to serve as such a great example to other candidates who are running right now for the first time and to give us hope in Texas. Things are not working out the way we want them to from our state's later leadership and the majority that's in power now, but we have really great people coming up and Lorraine is one of them. Um, before I let you go, uh, or before I go, I'm going to post this link and then I'm going to try to pin it. Um, so the, the comment pinned at the bottom is the website for Powered by People. Um, Powered by People, you might have heard me mention at the outset when we were talking about Catherine, uh, one of our Powered by People family members, was initially organized to help state legislative candidates in their campaigns with people power. Um, those of us who like knocking on doors or making phone calls or connecting directly with voters. After the pandemic began in this country and in the state of Texas, we've turned uh, 100% of our resources towards helping address those who are in need in our state. And we're specifically focused on making sure that we feed our fellow Texans who are unable to afford to feed themselves right now. We're seeing record demand at our food banks all over Texas, lines that stretch miles long, lines that we probably not have not seen the likes of since the Great Depression. And not only do we need money to buy the food to distribute to the people who need it, who are out of work in record numbers, but we also need volunteers who do not have any underlying conditions are under the age of 60 or 65, whatever the, the threshold is, um, who will wear a mask, wear gloves, keep six feet apart from other volunteers, but will pack the boxes of food and put those boxes of food into the cars or deliver them to the homes of those who do not have the means to feed themselves right now. If you go to Powered by People, which is a link at the bottom of the screen, and you sign up, and I'm specifically looking for those of you who are in the state of Texas. Although, if you're out of the state of Texas, you can help us phone bank to raise volunteers in Texas. But if you sign up at that link, one of our volunteer coordinators will get in touch with you and get you set up with a shift at your nearest food bank. Amy and I are volunteering at the food bank here in El Paso. We're going to work another shift this week. Um, but we're working shifts. Uh, our volunteers are all over the state of Texas, in Fort Worth, in Laredo, in Amarillo, in Dallas, in Houston, in Austin, in San Antonio, El Paso, everywhere. Um, the need is there. Um, you want to help uh, be there for your fellow Texan, your fellow human being. Signing up down here allows you to do that. You can also donate money that goes directly to food banks, does not stop with us, does not stop with any third party goes to those food banks so that they can buy the food they need to distribute to uh, our fellow Texans. So to everyone who's volunteered, donated, supported, thank you for doing that. It's an honor to do this work with you. Uh, so grateful that you all uh, joined us today and had a chance to meet Lorraine Birabil and looking forward to seeing you tomorrow. Kano, do we have a graphic for uh, tomorrow's guest? Let's see if we have that. Oh no. I didn't load it up, but it's none other than Jack, uh, Jack DiPremio, who is a uh, Jack. We'll, we'll get this graphic up tomorrow, who is um, typically the first one on this live stream, always asks such good questions. 
is a student activist and just really interested in hearing his perspective on things and then allowing you all to ask questions of him. Um, Cynthia, you're sending me his picture, but I've, I've got the uh, Instagram live going, so I can't uh, load the picture up from the text. But um, just imagine uh, a really good looking young man, and that's Jack. Uh, he'll be with us tomorrow. L, it's Jack DiPremio. I think I'm saying that right. Um, he'll, he'll, uh, he'll let me know. Okay, everybody, have a great rest of your Monday. Um, hope everyone had a great Easter yesterday. Everyone who's celebrating Passover is able to be with their families and is doing well. Uh, take care of each other. Be good to one another. Love you all. See you tomorrow. Bye-bye.